questions on anti counterfeiting they do, as I said, three days, three raids a day. Um, and I guess you're not really interested in what I'm saying. You aren't, you're asking why the hell am I an address? Well, there's three reasons why I'm an address. Uh, the first one is just to try and catch your attention on the last session of the day, uh, which I promise will be very short. The second of it is that dressed like this, you're unlikely to take me seriously, and I anticipate that. That's the very submission of my talk today on designs, that you do not take design seriously. It's a very neglected part of, of IP law, and I just want to quickly focus on that. And the third is because designs protect look and feel. And there's a story attached to this address. Yes, I got it from my wife's wardrobe. Um, but it's, yeah, good taste. It's a look-alike inspired by Vlishko dress, right? Not specifically Vlishko, but Vlishko is a Dutch brand uh, from the Netherlands. It, it was established many, many moons ago, Dutch East India Company coming around Africa. They stopped into trade in Ghana and Nigeria uh, and became, they took on African field design. Uh, they, they went further around to Indonesia and there was a technology in Indonesia about waxing and specifically creating dresses. So they fused the two, uh, or material, and they fused the two and they created a, an African-inspired African-Indonesian-inspired design that was branded in, um, in the Netherlands, and it is a very, very luxurious brand in Africa. And that's all well and good. It's got its own problems about using traditional knowledge and traditional design work and know-how. This is many of which has expired. Those are separate topics, but what it has a problem with is the marauding Chinese coming into the market and effectively counterfeiting their, their designs away. And we're seeing this not only in African luxury markets, luxury goods markets, in terms of clothing, and that's a real potential uh, opportunity, I would say, for the African continent, but really across every single industry. It's how do people, um, how does industry uh, cope with effectively a very effective uh, Chinese copycats? Uh, not always illegal, by the way. And one of them is on designs. So, um, just let me get my the thing. So I'm just quickly going to traverse four. I mean, when I asked this, I gave this initial presentation, not in address to the Interforum about a month ago. And I asked the audience, all from Africa and from outside Africa, if they were aware of any design cases outside of their own jurisdiction in Africa, not a single hand went up. And I'm actually delighted to say that I came across four in my various research. I'll just quickly talk to you about them and talk to you about how they were effective in dealing with the problem at hand. So we get to uh, Nigeria. This is a case of Star Brewery taking on Grand Lager. And this is a, a decision of the, the Supreme Court of Appeal there. So um, Star Breweries, uh, Nigerian Breweries, Breweries PLC have Star Lager. You haven't seen the bottle of Grand Lager, but it looks very similar to that bottle of uh, Star Lager. It's not particularly unique. I think you'd agree with me on that. But in any event, Nigerian Breweries PLC got a, a design registration for the shape of that bottle. And why is this relevant? Is that they sued Grand Lager Beer and, lo and behold, were unsuccessful. Right? So the moral of the story is not this. The moral of the story is that when you look at that case, you'll see, uh, well, you'll see a number of things, but the main thing is that there was, it was very thorough judgment on design law quite controversial, but thorough, and the appeal was dismissed at the, the junior, the lower court, and as well as the Supreme Court of Appeal. But this is why it is important, because Pabot Breweries had started in the, in the, in the early, well, the 1990s. It got some funding from a German company in about 2005, 2006, and that is when the litigation started. And I picked this up off a blog, and if you just take the time to read it, you'll see that what this litigation did is effectively keep them out of the market for about five or six years, until 2011. And those who have followed public breweries uh, since then have realized that South African breweries actually eventually purchased them as a launch pad into Nigeria. And for me, it's an, it's an example of a design registration strategically keeping a uh, another party out of the market, even though they lost the case, sufficiently to cause disruption. Um, moving on, in Zambia, 
Um, there's a case of two mattress brands. One had a design for the cloth of the mattress. You had a competitor coming in uh, at getting, uh, having a similar kind of cloth, but a substandard uh, mattress product. The uh, Manel investment sued them for design infringement. Uh, they lost um, in, in the court of the, the, the lower court, it then went to uh, one single judge in the, in the appeal court, and uh, the Supreme Court granted the injunction. Then the three-bench decision decided actually that, the, that the, the single judge had made an error and had no jurisdiction over this, but in any event granted the interim injunction. The reason why I, I mentioned that brief history, it's a bit of a palaver, because design registration quite clearly in Zambia is not something they come across often. So I think you've got to bear this in mind if, you, if you're litigating on designs, in fact, on any IP in, in, in Africa. Um, but at the same, by the same token, they granted the interim injunction. What this effectively did is that it stopped the, that person from entering the market for a period of time before the trial. Now, this was in 2001. There has been no subsequent trial, no subsequent decision. So what it did is got them off the market suffici in sufficiently early time for them to be uh, to negotiate a deal, to, to negotiate some kind of settlement, and again, is an effective use of a design registration to get a person out of the market and actually relatively quickly and cost-effectively. We get into Kenya. Now, Kenya is a fantastic market from a design perspective, much, much more vibrant than South Africa in terms of IP protection for designs. These cases, there the, are the a whole lot of them. This was decided in 2015. The design exists over the honeycomb bottle. Um, and they, uh, again, SafePak took, uh, took an issue with general plastics. They've been fighting each other, actually, uh, for quite some time. Uh, that's their design, the, the top part of that, that bottle. And they were sufficiently able, well, another example of them uh, enabling them to get an interim injunction to get general plastics out the market. They got the interim injunction. Pending uh, trial court, it may still obviously go to p trial, but it, uh, effectively the, the harm has been diverted until such time as it, it's been enforced. It also s it makes, uh, the, it's an example of a case where you can see in, in, the, pres in the, the, it was always a counterclaim for invalidity of that particular design, but the defendant took it uh, before the court when in fact they made a mistake and it should have taken to a tribunal. But in any event, all it shows is that there is a dearth of lack of skills in terms of uh, design enforcement in Africa, but one which you can use to your advantage. Finally, no design talk would be uh, complete, really, with some kind of an, uh, reference to the BMW case which took place in, in South Africa not long ago. The only thing I want to say about this particular case is although that BMW were not successful in uh, well, their, their aesthetic designs for uh, spare parts for their vehicles were effectively not upheld in the, by the Supreme Court of Appeal, they effectively controlled the spare parts market through design registration for many years prior to that. And I'll say on this case, it, it's uh, somewhat ironic, they refer to English cases to get what the interpretation of a, an aesthetic case, uh, aesthetic design is in South Africa, and ironically, that design would have probably been upheld in an English court. Um, but I just mentioned that to say, again, another successful use of, a des of designs for enforcement. Getting back into Africa, my little map of Africa is why would you invest in a design registration? Don't forget that the design registration can also protect brands. Okay, Two-dimensional designs for a logo, perhaps, can qualify as design protection. One of the biggest problems with registering as a trademark or even sometimes relying on copyright is that it takes too long. Copyright's too difficult to prove sometimes. Sometimes your design agency owns a copyright. The second thing is that um, uh, the, uh, the trademark takes too long. And the third one, don't forget the design aspect of it. In many countries in Africa, you can get a design registration in under a year. Okay, so in six months to a year, far quicker than you can get and far cheaper than some of the trademark registrations. And the nice thing about a design, it protects you across all classes, not just uh, your, your individual class for, for that particular good. So that's just, those are just uh, characteristics from the cases, just, just to highlight them there. Um, this was my map that I was referring to earlier. Very quickly, the red, the red areas are where design... Re, uh, in, so, just going back, no reported cases. Annual applications are less than 100 for most countries. In fact, neglected, as I, I've been wanting to say. It's not popular. Um, or design registration takes over a year. There is... Uh, yellow is indicative of some enforcement action, even if there are no reported cases. Low to moderate filings in terms of designs. Uh, popular for some 
and less than a year. And red is where the, oh, sorry, green is where the reported cases. The annual applications is pretty moderate. Nowhere are they high. Uh, and where it is popular and design registration can take place in six months. And those concentric rings indicate the level of activity there. What's quite good about this map, I expected it to be barren red. It's got a lot of green shoots there, and I suspect if you have a greater look, and this is of interest to you, you can pick and choose uh, areas of, of which, which will help you. Um, just interesting, some interesting facts are from South Africa. Who do you think the biggest filer is of designs in South Africa? Okay, it happens to be Nike followed very quickly by Samsung. All right, so that just gives you an indication of, and, and then some motor vehicle brands. Uh, a repo stats, which is the English-speaking kind of area of, of, in Africa, particularly about 15 or 16 countries uh, for design registration, they are saying that most of their incoming designs come from South Korea, followed by South Africa going into, uh, followed by South Africa and a repo countries going into Africa, and then the United States, then the United Kingdom. So just interesting to some, some interesting stats to see where design uh, innovation is coming from and these strategies. Um, and then just finally, my well, last slide is just, uh, I'm hoping that this talk, if anything, has just provided a little bit of education and awareness of designs. When I asked across the, the entire continent why the why they were, what are the big characteristics of either why designs were popular or not, those are the ones that they were listing. And lack of education and awareness. And one of the biggest advantages uh, is at the bottom is the speed of examination for registered designs. So thank you for that, and I'm hoping I've at least alerted you to the possibility of getting designs as part of your IP protection strategy. On that note, um, that's the end of the seminar. Thank you very much for coming in. It is intended to be an intensive, short burst of, of, of talks. I hope it's done its trick. Please could you just complete. You can either leave them on your chair or hand them on, on, on the side. Thanks very much for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your day.